It is not that I meant to bother you, he pleaded, but that I have travelled seven hundred miles from Tokyo just to talk to you. Let me ask you only a few questions. Please, just five minutes will do, fool that I was. I should have known better. His ability to twist and weave through a conversation was uncanny. His five minutes became three days. Every morning he commuted to my home from his hotel and took many notes. Never have I encountered such tact. He made me talk almost about everything. His questions kept away from the war, until I discovered that the stories of my personal accounts were of the war. He soon found out that I had lost all optimism, and that our Navy flyers at Rabaul, despite their many successes, were now waging an uphill battle at Guadalcanal, and virtually without any cooperation from the fighters and bombers of the Japanese army. We need more fighters and more experienced pilots, I told him in a fit of anger. Every Zero fighter should be pulled off the line and run through a complete overhaul after 150 hours in the air. This has nothing to do with battle damage. Even if the airplane never fires a shot and is never fired at in return, it requires that overhaul. Now, we can't do that anymore. We consider a Zero in excellent condition if it is only slightly shot up and has a complete overhaul after 200 hours. Do you know what it means for a pilot to go into combat with an airplane that won't answer every demand at the controls? Only the best of our flyers can take that kind of a ship into battle and come out alive. If the new pilots we're sending overseas as replacements don't measure up to the standards of the men with whom I flew, then heaven help them. The American Navy pilots we encountered over Guadalcanal were the best I have ever fought, and their tactics were superb. And their planes are certain to improve. The reporter was more than satisfied. He could not conceal his elation as he thanked me profusely and bid me goodbye. I was to find out later, however, that I had committed a major error even in talking to him at all. A week later, I returned to the Sasebo Hospital and filed a request for a final medical checkup, which would qualify me for reassignment. It was accepted. They assigned me to a cot in the hospital and told me I would remain for several days until they could complete the examination. Early the next morning I was summoned to the administration office at Sasebo headquarters. The roof had caved in. The personnel captain's face was red from his anger. Warrant Officer Sakai, he shouted. You are an idiot. I just received a wire from Naval Military Headquarters in Tokyo telling me that they have suppressed in its entirety the interview you gave to that reporter from the Yomiuri Shimbun. Have you taken leave of your senses, saying the things you did? Now you listen to me, Sakai. Tokyo has reprimanded me sharply for my lack of surveillance over the men under my command. I will not stand for this kind of stupidity. I tell you now that you will release not one single word about your combat duty, without first clearing with the public information officer, do you understand, any repetition of the nonsense which you just issued will result not only in your court-martial, but mine as well. And no one, no one you understand is going to do that to me. I understood perfectly. I was to be gagged, but I could sympathise with my superior's position. It was all very simple, Sakai. Just keep your mouth shut. I returned to the hospital, brooding at the tongue-lashing I had just received. Someone called my name. An orderly stood stiffly at attention in the doorway, saluting. What is it? I snapped. You have a visitor, sir. A tall naval flyer is waiting for you in the visitor's room. I think he said his name is Nishizawa. What? I shouted. Nishizawa, can it really be he? I forgot everything that had happened and dashed madly from the room, nearly knocking the startled orderly off his feet. I opened the door to the visitor's room and stared in. A tall, lean man paced slowly in the room, a cigarette in his mouth. It was, he hadn't changed a bit. He looked up at me, smiling broadly, and shouted, Sakai! I yelled his name, Nishizawa. The next second we were pounding each other on the back, happy beyond all words. I held my good friend at arm's length. Let me look at you, I cried. You look wonderful, no wounds, I asked hastily. None, Saburo, came the welcome answer. I left Rabul in November, not a scratch on me. It seems that all those bullets just never caught up. I was elated, huh? We named you properly, all right, I said. Truly you are our own devil, my friend, to have come through Lei and Rabaul without a mark on you. Nishizawa, it is simply wonderful to see you again. Tell me, how did things go after I left? By now you must be the Navy's leading pilot.
Oh, I can just imagine you over Guadalcanal. He waved his hands in protest. You make too much of me, Saburo, he complained. I am not even sure of the exact figure. Maybe around fifty or so, but I am still far behind you, he smiled. Perhaps you do not realise it, but you are still the best of all our pilots. Ah, you talk like a fool, old friend, I said. I have seen you fly too many times. I am afraid, Nishizawa, that you shall be our leading ace before too long. But tell me, what are you doing at Sasebo? They sent me home to the Yokosuka wing, he answered, his face turning glum. An instructor. That's what they made me, an instructor, Saburo. Can you picture me running around in a rickety old biplane, teaching some fool youngster how to bank and turn, and how to keep his pants dry, me? I laughed. He was right. Nishizawa just wasn't the instructor type. Well, he continued, after a little time at that I felt disgusted, so I volunteered to go overseas again just as soon as they would let me. I received my orders this morning. I'm reassigned to the Philippines, that's why I had to see you today. We take off tomorrow morning, so soon, it is the way I wish it to be, Saburo, he replied. Flying around Yokosuka is not for me. I want a fighter under my hands again. I simply have to get back into action. Staying home in Japan is killing me. I knew how he felt. Indeed, I knew too well. But there were other things to discuss, our other friends. I envy you, Nishizawa. But come, tell me about Rabul. Let me hear about everyone else. Where is Lieutenant Sasai now? And Ota, is he with you? What about my wingmen, Yonikawa and Hattori? Tell me all about them. What? He stared at me. His face blank. Despair crowded his eyes. So they did not tell you. What are you talking about? He waved his hand feebly. What is the matter with you, Nishizawa? Weren't they sent home with you? He turned away, his back to me, his voice choked. Saburo, they are... He put a hand to his forehead. Then he spun around, dead. I couldn't believe it. It was impossible. What are you saying? I yelled at him. They are all dead. You and I, Saburo, you and I, we are the only ones still alive. It couldn't be true. My knees buckled. I leaned against a table. While my mind tried to comprehend this tragedy, Nishizawa began to talk. Lieutenant Sasai was the first. We made a sweep to Guadalcanal on August 26. It was not as you remember, Saburo. I don't know how many wildcats there were, but they seemed to come out of the sun in an endless stream. We never had a chance. Our formation went to pieces. We had to scatter so quickly that no one saw Sasai's plane go down. We thought that perhaps he had been hurt and had gone ahead of us, but when we returned to Rabul, he was missing. He never came back. Nishizawa sighed wearily. Then it was Ota, just one week later. Every time we went out, we lost more and more planes. Guadalcanal was completely under the enemy's control. Ota went the same way as Sasai. No one saw his plane go down. He just didn't come home then. About three or four days after that, Yonakawa and Hattori were shot down. Both of them died the same day of all the men who returned with me. Only Captain Saito, Commander Nakajima, and less than six of the other pilots who were in our original group of eighty men survived. I was stunned. Nishizawa remained silent, waiting for me to speak again. It seemed so unreal. How could they all be dead, four of my best friends? They were all killed while I lay helplessly in the Yokosuka hospital. Now I understood why I had failed to learn of their loss before. Nishizawa and Nakajima had made sure that the news did not reach me, not when the operation on my eyes had just been performed. Their faces swam before me. I remembered Ota laughing from his cockpit as we looped over Moresby. Yonakawa and Hattori, who clung grimly to my tail through all the air battles, always alert to protect me, to keep me from being killed. Sasai, he and now they were dead. I sobbed aloud, without shame. Like a child, I could not stop. My body shook helplessly. Nishizawa grasped my hand, begging me to stop. Saburo, please, he implored. Please stop it. I looked up at him. I am an accursed man, he choked at me. I never saw Sasai and Ota going down. I never even knew they had been lost. Our best friends, Saburo, our best friends, and I didn't do anything to help them. I must be Satan's bastard, he raged, going after other planes while they died around me. He sat down again. No, no, it is not true. There was nothing I could do. There were just too many enemy planes, just too many, his voice trailed off. We sat silently for a long time, looking at each other. 
What more was there to say? I was discharged from Sasebo Hospital during the last week of January, 1943. The long months of medical attention were over. I reported to my original outfit, the Tainan Fighter Wing of the 11th Air Fleet, now stationed at Toyohashi in central Japan. I had first joined the wing during its formation in September of 1941 at Tainan on Formosa. Of the 150 pilots who had left Tainan during the great Japanese sweep across the Pacific, less than 20 were now alive. These veterans formed the core of the new wing, the majority of the members of which were green pilots rushed through training schools at Tsuchiura and other air bases. Commander Tadashi Nakajima personally greeted me when I arrived at Toyohashi. Neither he nor I ever thought that we would meet here, instead of back at Rabaul. Thank heaven that Nakajima was my superior officer again. He engaged in no nonsense about my not being able to fly, and the very next day I went aloft. Only in a flying fortress, this was the same B-17 which the army had captured at Bandung, Java, in March of 1942. Every man of my original outfit went up in the great bomber, we got a tremendous kick out of flying the bomber, which impressed us with its excellent controllability and, above all, the precision workmanship of its equipment. No large Japanese airplane I had ever seen was in its class. The next day I returned to my first Love the Zero. I can never describe the wonder of the feelings which came back to me as I took the fighter into the air. She handled like a dream, just a flick of the wrist she was gone, I went through all sorts of aerobatics, standing the zero on her tail, diving, sliding off on the wings. I was drunk with the air again. As an officer, I acquired an entirely new perspective of the war. Enlisted men were denied access to the secret combat reports which the Navy distributed to its officer personnel. Several days after my arrival at Toyohashi, Nakajima wordlessly showed me the report of our withdrawal from Guadalcanal on February 7, 1943, exactly six months after the Americans had landed. The radios blared of strategic withdrawals, of tightening our defence lines, but the secret reports revealed a staggering defeat and appalling losses. Two full divisions of army troops were gone, annihilated by the savagely fighting enemy. The Navy had lost the equivalent of an entire peacetime fleet. Rusting in the mud off Guadalcanal were the blasted hulks of no less than two battleships, one aircraft carrier, five cruisers, twelve destroyers, eight submarines, hundreds upon hundreds of fighters and bombers, not to mention the crack fighter pilots and all the bomber crews. What had happened to us, we had stormed through the Pacific with impunity. Time and again we had whipped the enemy fighter planes, but the secret reports from the front told of new enemy fighters far superior to the P-39s and P-40s, and for the first time I learned what really had happened at Midway last June, four carriers and nearly 300 airplanes, with most of their pilots lost. It was unbelievable. My heart sank when I saw the new pilot arrivals assigned to the Tainan Wing. They were eager and serious young men, unquestionably brave. But determination and courage were no substitute for pilot skill, and these men lacked the fine temper which they would need against the Americans who stormed the Pacific in every increasing numbers. These recruits, with their shining faces, were they to fill the yawning gulf left by such men as Sasai and Ota. How, how in the name of heaven, could they be expected to do that? Their training at Toyohashi was severe. From sun up to sundown, the instructors ran them through their paces, classroom studies, and more and more flying. Teach them to hold their formations, that's a control stick you're holding there, not a broom handle. Don't just fly your airplane, become a part of it. This is how you save fuel, squeeze your trigger for short bursts, don't burn out your guns. All the lessons of the past battles relived again, trying to implant the invaluable lessons, the little tricks, the advantages in these new men. But we didn't have enough time. We couldn't watch for individual errors and take the long hours necessary to weed the faults out of a trainee. Hardly a day passed when fire engines and ambulances did not race down the runways, sirens shrieking, to dig one or more pilots out of the plane they had wrecked on a clumsy takeoff or landing. Not all the new pilots were so ill-equipped to master the training planes and fighters. Many appeared as gifted in the air as the great aces in 1939 and 1940 had been but their numbers were distressingly few. 
and there would be no painless interval for them to gain many hours in the air or any combat experience before they were thrown against the Americans. Less than a month after Guadalcanal fell, we were called in for a special officers' conference to hear news of a further disaster. The report remained classified throughout the rest of the war and was never revealed to the Japanese public. Behind locked doors I read that a Japanese convoy of more than 20 ships, 12 transports, 8 destroyers and several smaller auxiliaries had attempted to land army troops at Lae, my old fighter airbase. At least hundred enemy fighters and bombers attacked the convoy on the open seas with determined runs, sinking all the transports and at least five of the destroyers. The news carried implications of a disaster greater than Guadalcanal, for it meant that the enemy now dominated the skies as far north as Ley, and that we were helpless to stop his incredibly effective attacks against our shipping. Several days later, the Tainan air wing was ordered to transfer without delay to Rabul. Commander Nakajima asked me if I would accompany him back to the Southwest Pacific. How could he believe I wished to do otherwise? Nakajima told me that despite the loss of my right eye, he was convinced I was better than the new pilots. That night, headquarters posted a list of the men who were transferring to Rabul. My name was included, but we failed to reckon with the chief surgeon at Toyahashi. He was outraged when he read my name on the list, he stormed into Nakajima's office and vented his wrath on the unhappy commander. You are out of your mind, he bellowed. Do you want to kill this man? What is wrong with you? Even to consider allowing a one-eyed pilot to go into combat, he wouldn't stand a chance. The whole thing is preposterous. I will not allow Sakai to transfer to Rabul. We could hear them shouting at the other side of the field. Nakajima protested that I was better than most of the new flyers, that, two eyes or one, Nothing could replace my skill behind the controls of a zero, nor, for that matter, my long combat experience. The surgeon refused to budge an inch. Now Nakajima became angry. They argued back and forth for several hours, but in the end it was the surgeon who emerged triumphant. He persuaded Nakajima to change his mind. As he left the commander's office, I ran up to him and begged him to change his mind. He stared unbelievingly at me. He tried to speak but his face turned redder and redder until he yelled, Shut up! at me and stalked off, muttering that all flyers were crazy. I was reassigned as a flight instructor to the Omura Air Base near Sasebo. The new wing arrived at Rabul on April 3rd. Before a week passed, I read in the battlefront reports, they had carried out major attacks against Guadalcanal, Milne Bay, Port Darwin and other critical targets. In four missions, enemy fighters and anti-aircraft guns shot no less than 49 of the wing's planes out of the air. Disaster followed disaster. On April 19th, a horrible rumour, shortly thereafter confirmed, spread among the officers. On the 18th, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, the esteemed commander-in-chief of the Imperial Japanese Navy, was killed. I read and re-read the action report, Admiral Yamamoto was a passenger in one of two bombers escorted by Zero fighters when several of the Americans' new P-38 fighters ripped through the Zero cover and blasted both bombers from the sky. And I sat at Amura, training new pilots. I found it hard to believe when I saw the new trainees staggering along the runway, bumping their way into the air. The Navy was frantic for pilots, and the school was expanded almost every month, with correspondingly lower entrance requirements. Men who could never have dreamed even of getting near a fighter plane before the war were now thrown into battle. Everything was urgent. We were told to rush the men through, to forget the fine points, just to teach them how to fly and shoot. One after the other, singly, in twos and threes, the training plane smashed into the ground, skidded wildly through the air. For long and tedious months, I tried to build fighter pilots from the men they thrust at us at Omura. It was a hopeless task. Our facilities were too meagre, the demand too great, the students too many. I felt I was rusting away. There was no longer any doubt that our country was in trouble. The civilian populace was not aware of this fact, nor were the students, nor any of the enlisted men. But those officers who saw the reports, who had been in combat, realised the gravity of the situation. The majority adhered to their unshakable belief that Japan would emerge the victor, but the victory parties and glad cries were fewer and further between than before. 
Not even my remoteness from the field of battle reduced the immediacy or the pain of the war. In September of 1943, I was shocked to learn that an old and close friend, one of Japan's greatest pilots, naval aviation pilot Kenji Okabe, had been shot down and killed over Bougainville. He had been a classmate at Tsuchiura, and was the ace who set our Navy's all-time record by shooting down seven enemy planes in a single day's action. Was there no end to their deaths? As I read on, I felt like weeping. After Okabe's sensational day in the air over Rabul, Admiral Ninichi Kusaka, the commander of the 9th Air Fleet, had requested naval headquarters in Tokyo to award his pilot a medal for his outstanding valour. Nothing had changed. Tokyo had refused the request on the basis of no precedent, exactly as it had refused Captain Saito a year before. Admiral Kusaka, however, was not to be turned aside so easily. Irritated at the decision from headquarters, the Admiral had bestowed upon Okabe in a special honour presentation his own ceremonial sword. Three days later, Okabe burned to death when his zero fell in flames. In April of 1944, after long and wearying months of training student pilots at Omura, I was transferred to the Yokosuka Air Wing. Prior to the war, Yokosuka was a coveted assignment, since it was an Imperial Guard air unit which protected the air gateway to Tokyo. Now it was just another wing. The days of coveted assignments were past. With the secret reports available to me as an officer, I had been able to maintain a true appraisal of the war. The secret documents were a far cry from the drivel shouted over the radios to the unsuspecting populace. Everywhere in the Pacific our units were being forced back, incredibly powerful American task forces, fleet units the size of which staggered the imagination, roamed the Pacific almost at will. I read report after report, telling of the murderous havoc raised by these swift striking fleets. The enemy's army air force had grown tremendously in power, by the hundreds, their P-38s soared above the reach of our fighters, choosing combat at will. New types of fighters and bombers appeared almost daily, and our pilots' stories of their vastly improved performance boded ill for the future. We were still hanging on at Rabul, but no longer did that once mighty bastion threaten Moresby and the enemy's other bases. Rabul suffered in more ways than one. The Americans were using it for bombing practice, to break in their new replacements. Soon after I reached Yokosuka, I requested leave and took the train from the naval base to Tokyo, only ninety minutes away. My uncle's family welcomed me as if their own son had returned for a visit. I knew that any time I could leave the base for several hours or longer, this was my home. That night, after dinner, Hatsuyo began to chide me about the fact that I had not yet married. Her teasing seemed fully as serious as it was fun, and I shot back, why are you still single, my dear cousin? What is wrong with you, that you have not yet selected for yourself a nice husband? My uncle and aunt interrupted the fireworks, laughing at us, the both of you. My uncle mocked us, so choosy I grinned. I don't see why Hatsuyo-san hasn't picked out a husband. Just look at her, she's as pretty as any movie star in the country. And how many girls today can boast of being an accomplished pianist, I grinned. I do believe, I said to them, looking at Hatsuyo, that you could select for her an excellent husband. My uncle and aunt smiled at my remarks, but not Hatsuyo. She glared at me and looked the other way, her eyes averted. What is wrong, Hatsuyo-san? She ignored me. I was startled. She was angry. I changed the subject at once. Hatsuyo-san, will you favour me, please, the piano? It is a long time since you have honoured me with a recital. She looked at me questioningly. Remember when I first enrolled at school, you played... Let me see. Yes, I remember now. Mozart, will you play it again? For reply, Hatsuyo walked to the piano and sat down. As her fingers caressed the ivory keys, who would have thought a war was raging across thousands of miles in the Pacific? I closed my eyes and in my mind saw the flickering blue exhausts of fighters and bombers taxiing down runways, hurling dust and stones behind them, lifting with a thundering crescendo of power off the ground to disappear into the night, many of them not to return. And here I sat in the Tokyo suburbs, relaxed, my body whole and well, my stomach full, basking in the warmth and affection of these people who loved me no less than a son. And others were dying. It was a strange world. The music stopped. 
Hatsuyo sat at the piano for several moments, then turned and looked at me strangely. Her eyes were wide and questioning, and she spoke softly. Saburo-san, I have another I wish to play, especially for you. Listen carefully. It will tell you something I cannot myself express in words. She looked so strange, then a flush spread over her face and she quickly averted her gaze. She played for a long time. The music rolled from the piano, lifted quietly and drifted through the room, then crashed and soared. I looked at this girl, I knew her, and yet I knew her not at all. Never had I seen Hatsuyo like this. What did she mean when she said, It will tell you something I cannot myself express. Suddenly I realised I was looking at Hatsuyo, not as a young girl, not as my cousin, but as a woman. For the first time I really saw her, intent at the keyboard, her fingers flashing up and down, her face tense as she poured her soul into the music. Hatsuyo and I, the thought was staggering. But she was no longer a child. Wake up, Sakai, you fool, she is a woman. She is telling you now this moment that she is in love with you. I knew now what she meant. In a rush of emotion, I wished to respond. It could not be, I told myself. But it was. It is. It is, Hatsuyo. You are in love with her, you fool, and you did not even know how she felt. I remembered the hospital, when she threw her arms around me and sobbed that she was sure I would fly again. So she had loved me, and for much longer than I would have dared imagine it was so strange. At that moment I knew that I too was in love with her, but what could I do? I had suffered those dark months long ago, when Fujiko cried at my refusal. Were the reasons now any the less compelling, could I throw away the love of Fujiko then, because I was half blind, and do less than to refuse Hatsuyo's unspoken plea to me? How could I now humble my pride, ignore these same beliefs, pretend that miraculously I could see again clearly and well enough to take to the air as the ace I once was? Could I do all that and retain my integrity? No, so far as Hatsuyo was concerned, her message was wasted on me. I gave no indication that I knew what she was telling me, that I wished fervently to respond. When Hatsuyo finished playing, I waited as long as courtesy required, then retired for the evening, pleading weariness. But I did not fall asleep for many hours during my assignment to Yokosuka. I visited Tokyo often. In the eighteen months of my absence, the capital city had changed. The colour and gaiety were gone. People no longer laughed as quickly or as heartily. The streets were dreary and lifeless. The people moved along, heads bent, intent on their own problems. The warship march no longer generated enthusiasm. Too many sons of these same people, too many husbands and brothers and uncles and nephews, were never to come home again. But Tokyo still did not truly reflect the war, although the shouting was over. The stores had run short of commodities, and strict rationing was now in force. People braved the wind and the cold in long queues, waiting for bowls of steaming broth. The homeland remained untouched, however, except for that one single raid back in 1942, the daring flight of Doolittle's bombers, which raced over the city and fled for China. Tokyo and all our cities had remained unviolated by the thunder and the screaming pieces of steel from American bombs. War came to Japan in June of 1944, the effect on our population was unmistakable. On June 15th, the people of Japan were shocked to hear that 20 bombers, tremendous giants of the air which dwarfed the powerful B-17, had flown an incredible distance from China to attack a city in northern Kyushu. The raid did little damage, and 20 planes were hardly enough to cause national excitement. But in the homes and the stores, in the factories and on the streets, everywhere in Japan, the people talked about the raid discussed the fact that our fighters had failed to stop the bombers. They all asked the same questions, who was next, when, and how many bombers would come. The newscasters gave them something else to worry about. The Americans had invaded Saipan. In more ways than one, the war had come home. Saipan was not very distant. The maps were unrolled, and our people looked for the tiny dot which lay not so far off our coastline. And they looked at each other, they began to question never aloud, but in furtive conversations the ceaseless reports of victories. How could we have smashed the enemy's ships, destroyed his planes, decimated his armies, if Saipan had been invaded? It was a question which everyone asked, but which very few dared to answer. 
No sooner did we receive the news of the Saipan attack than powerful units of our fleet sailed for the Marianas to engage in what everyone at Yokosuka knew would be one of the decisive battles of the war. We were no longer invading foreign islands. We were guarding the very portals of our homeland. The next morning the Yokosuka wing received orders to transfer to the island of Iwo Jima. Our high command feared that, with Saipan secured, the Americans would strike next at that strategic point. With Iwo Jima in their hands, all of Japan was imperiled. Those great battles in the Marianas are history. Saipan fell before the terrible enemy onslaught. Our navy sustained a crushing defeat, and the American task forces roamed the Pacific, all-powerful, indomitable, and fearless. The fact that Iwo Jima was not invaded in the summer of 1944 surprised us all. The island was barely able to defend itself. A fraction of the force which took Saipan could have stormed Iwo's beaches, and crushed the token resistance which our skeleton forces then on the island could have mustered. For some unknown reason the invasion was delayed for many long months, during which time the army and navy poured men and weapons onto the strategic little isle. When the Yokosuka air wing received orders to establish an air defence of the island, we were able to spare only 30 Zero fighters for the task. 30 fighter planes, essentially the very same Zero with which I had fought in China nearly five years before. That was all, yet no invasion came. We considered this turn of events nothing less than a miracle. Commander Nakajima was back at Yokosuka. One month after he had left Toyohashi for Rabul, Tokyo had ordered him to return to Japan for reassignment to Yokosuka, where he was to help turn out new fighter pilots at a record rate. Now, after a year on the homeland, he was leaving again, but for a campaign of more epic proportions than any he had ever undertaken. I received orders to report to his office, Sakai. Why don't you come with me this time? he asked. You know how anxious I am to have you flying with me again. I don't care what any doctors say. You were, you are now, an excellent pilot. You prove it every time I see you fly. He paused. Let us be entirely honest, Saburo. You know better than any of us the questionable ability of these new pilots. I fear for their lives once they face the new American planes. We need something to bolster their morale, to give them a greater will to fight. You see, Saburo, I need you with me, desperately. You are almost a god to these men. With you flying with us, their morale will soar. They will follow you anywhere. You need to ask me, sir. I burst out. You ask me if I will go with you. How many times have I tried? How many times have I been told no, you cannot fly, Sakai? You are half blind, Sakai. You are no good anymore, Sakai. Of course I want to go. I want to go with you, sir. I want to fight again. Times had changed. No surgeon rose in heated protest to prevent my leaving. The niceties of keeping a one-eyed pilot out of the war no longer existed. We could not afford to worry about such minor details any longer. Japan herself was endangered, and a one-eyed pilot with my combat experience was no longer a liability. I had come into my own again. My country needed me. We received orders to leave at once for Iwo Jima. We did not even have time in which to contact our families. There were no farewells. On the morning of June 16th, we took off from Yokosuka and moved into formation as we headed for the distant island. We never made Iwo. After 100 miles of wild flying through a low, thick, overcast and torrential rains, we were forced to turn back for Yokosuka. Japan's rainy season had begun. Nakajima and I could have made it to Iwo, as could several other flyers. But the majority of the 30 pilots in our group were inexperienced men. The storms would have detached them from our formation in no time, and that would have been their end. Iwo Jima is a tiny island 650 miles south of Yokosuka. It is barely two miles across at its widest point. On a global map, Iwo seems to be the last of a long series of stepping stones in the Bonin group which extends from Yokosuka to Guam. Maps are notoriously misleading, however, and in the vast reaches of the Pacific, the distance between each small outcropping of land can assume terrifying proportions. Without radar, indeed, without even radios in our Zero fighters, we dared not risk the loss of most of our planes. Our experience in such matters had been tragic. Early in 1943, several squadrons of Army fighter planes, manned by pilots who had absolutely no experience in long-distance flying over the ocean, 
left Japan for a base to the south. En route, they encountered severe weather conditions, but refused to turn back. Almost every plane disappeared in the endless reaches of the Pacific. We tried again the following morning, June 17th. This time we flew less than 100 miles from Yokosuka before the storms forced our return. Although ironically, the weather over Iwo Jima and the Marianas was reported perfect. We languished in our billets, listening to radio reports from our island garrisons, telling of the enemy air attacks all through the day and on into the night. Four times we took off for Iwo, and four times the raging storms foiled our flight. On June 20th, when we made our fifth attempt, the weather conditions were still far below minimum safety standards. Nakajma, however, was determined to get through. The inexperienced pilots glued their eyes to the wings and tails of the lead zeros, and we fought our way through the violent updrafts and blinding sheets of rain. None of us knew it at the time, of course, but this was the day our major fleet units suffered a disastrous beating by the planes and guns of the enemy task force rampaging through the Marianas. Finally, we came out of the storm front several minutes later, after we had flown 650 miles, Iwo's volcanic hump loomed out of the water. Nakajima began a wide circle over the second airstrip, over Mount Motoyama, in the centre of Iwo. I had thought the dusty runway of Lai Bad, but this was impossible. Landing on the deck of a pitching and rolling aircraft carrier would have been simpler than descending to the monstrosity below us. Two sides of the landing strip were steep rock walls, even the slightest skid on landing and a ball of fire. At the end of the runway, there waited for any unwary pilot who missed his brakes a towering cliff. Nakajima refused to take his men onto the forbidding runway. He led the formation back to the first airfield on the southern slopes of the volcanic island. Here was a wide, long runway, one after the other. The fighters dropped from the air. More than 90 planes lined the long runway. Not an inch of parking space for our fighters was left. Nakajima waved his arm above his cockpit to signal the other fighters to follow him. A long, winding road led from the main airfield to the second strip. The distance was more than a mile, and the smaller runway was at a level higher than the one we were leaving. I felt ridiculous as I jockeyed the zero along on the road. This was my first and my last experience climbing the side of a mountain in a taxiing fighter plane, and in a convoy of thirty fighters, a battalion of army troops watched our queer convoy, with its clouds of dust and blatting motors, their mouths gaping open in disbelief. Many of them pointed their arms at us, laughing loudly and jeering. It was hardly funny to us, taxiing the zero up that tortuous slope with a fighter in front of me, and a whirling propeller immediately behind, while we all tried to negotiate the hairpin curves was as hazardous as maintaining tight formation in a thick fog. Fortunately, we had arrived at Iwo during a temporary lull in the fighting. Only the day before, the island had rocked and heaved beneath the impact of thousands of shells from the American task force which steamed offshore. Now they were back at Saipan, steadily reducing the fortifications on that island to wreckage. For three days the war spared Iwo, not that it was a place where any sane man would voluntarily want to remain. It was as dreary, hostile and uncomfortable as Rabul, if not more so. But we were left to our own devices, and took advantage of the lull in the fighting to soak in the hot springs which bubbled through the rocks from one end of the island to the other. The war never seemed stranger to us. We knew by now that our fleet had been shattered in the Marianas sea fight, and that practically all of the carrier pilots in the battle had died. There was no doubt that the overwhelming might of the American invasion forces, supported by many hundreds of planes and the thousands of heavy guns on the ships, would annihilate our troops on Saipan to the last man. And we soaked in hot baths on Iwo Jima. Our officers were desperate. They knew all too well the need for help at Saipan, but what could we do? A mass assault by our fighters would have only a temporary and meaningless effect, for Saipan lay nearly 600 miles south of Iwo. On the other hand, we could not sit comfortably on our islands while our friends were blasted to bits. There was still another factor if we left, Iwo Jima unattended by dozens of fighters ready for instant flight, then the Americans could in those unguarded hours storm the island's defence and move in against weak opposition. Finally, it was decided that the fighters would remain, 
but that the bombers would attack the American warships cruising off Saipan. Each attack would be made at night, the unescorted bombers leaving in groups of eight or nine. When I watched these planes roaring down the Iwo runways, their blue exhausts illuminating the wings and fuselage, the old days at Ley flashed back into my mind. I finally began to understand what had motivated the crews of the Mitchells and Marauders, which pounded Ley day and night without fighter escort, hurling their defiance in the teeth of dozens of Zero fighter planes. Now I saw the other side of the picture, but it was worse. In the early months of 1942, the American twin-engine bombers had a fighting chance. With the Bettys, it was different. Let a fighter plane catch a Betty in its sights for a second or two. Let an anti-aircraft shell spill its hot fragments into the fuselage. And the odds were that there would be no more bomber, but a roaring mass of flames disintegrating into the water. The hours between each takeoff and the return of the surviving bombers seemed interminable. Our pilots carried out their bombing runs with the utmost gallantry and scored some hits, but what did it mean? These were only flea bites, and every night perhaps one or two planes limped back to Iwo Jima with fuselage and wings hold, the crews desperately tired, their eyes haggard from watching their friends going down, one after the other, even before they were within attack range. The few pilots who returned to the island told us of fighters coming in after them in almost total darkness, and finding their planes unerringly in the gloom, of tracers bursting bright as day, when all the guns on the American ships opened up at them. Brilliant explosions, cobwebs of spitting tracers, which seemed to be impenetrable walls of fire blocking their path as they swung into their bombing runs. In a few days there were hardly any of the twin-engine Mitsubishi bombers left on the island. Then Iwo threw in its torpedo bombers, single-engine planes, Jills, which attempted zero-level torpedo attacks. They fared little better than the larger planes. On June 24th, the quiet lull which had settled over Iwo Jima disappeared. It was about 5.20am, when the air raid alarms set up a terrific din across the island. Early warning radar had caught several large groups of enemy aircraft less than 60 miles to the south and coming in fast. Every fighter plane on the island more than 80 zeros thundered down the two runways and sped into the air. Mechanics dragged the remaining Bettys and Jills to shelter. This was it. The long wait was about to be rewarded. I had a zero under my hands again, and in another few moments I would know by the acid test of actual combat if I had lost my skill. An overcast at 13,000 feet hung in the sky. The fighters divided into two groups, 40 zeros climbing above the cloud layer, and the other forty my group remaining below. No sooner had I eased out of my climb than an enemy fighter spun wildly through the clouds, trailing a long plume of flame and black smoke. I had only a brief look at the fighter, it was a new type, unmistakable with its broad wings and blunt nose, the new Grumman I had heard so much about the Hellcat. I swung into a wide turn and looked up another Grumman came out of the clouds, diving vertically, smoke pluming behind. Hard on the heels of the smoking fighter came scores of Hellcats, diving steeply. All forty zeros turned and climbed to meet the enemy planes head-on. There was no hesitation on the part of the American pilots. The Grummans screamed in to attack. Then the planes were all over the sky, swirling from sea level to the cloud layer in wild dogfights. The formations were shredded, I snapped into a tight loop and rolled out on the tail of a Hellcat, squeezing out a burst as soon as the plane came into the rangefinder. He rolled away and my bullets met only empty air. I went into a left vertical spiral and kept closing the distance, trying for a clear shot at the plane's belly. The Grumman tried to match the turn with me. For just that moment I needed, his underside filled the rangefinder and I squeezed out a second burst. The cannon shells exploded along the fuselage, the next second thick clouds of black smoke poured back from the airplane and it went into a wild, uncontrolled dive for the sea. Everywhere I looked there were fighters, long trails of smoke, bursts of flame and exploding planes. I looked too long, flashing tracers poured directly beneath my wing, and instinctively I jerked the stick over to the left, rolling back to get on his tail and snapping out a burst. Missed, he dove out of range faster than I could follow. I cursed at myself for having been caught without warning, and with equal vehemence I cursed my blind eye, which left almost half of my area of vision blank. 
As quickly as I could, I slipped out of the parachute straps and freed my body, so I could turn around in my seat, making up for the loss of side vision. And I looked without a second to spare. At least a half dozen Grummans were on my tail, jockeying into firing position. Their wings burst into sparkling flame as they opened fire. Another left roll fast, and the tracers slipped harmlessly by. The six fighters ripped past my wings and zoomed in, climbing turns to the right. Not this time. Oh no. I slammed the throttle on over boost and rolled back to the right, turning after the six fighters with all the speed the Zero would give me. I glanced behind me, no other fighters in the back. One of these was going to be mine. I swore. The Zero closed the distance to the nearest plane rapidly. Fifty yards away I opened up with the cannon, watching the shells move up the fuselage and disappear into the cockpit. Bright flashes and smoke appeared beneath the glass. The next moment the Hellcat swerved crazily and fell off on one wing, its smoke trail growing with each second. But there were more fighters on my tail. Suddenly I didn't want to close with them. Weariness spread over me like a smothering cloak. In the old days at Ley, I would have wasted no time in hauling the Zero around and going for them. But now I felt as though my stamina had been wrung dry. I didn't want to fight. I dove and ran for it. In this condition it would have been sheer suicide to oppose the Hellcats. There would have been a slip, a second's delay in moving the stick or the rudder bar, and that would be all. I wanted time in which to regain my breath, to shake off the sudden dizziness. Perhaps it was the result of trying to see as much with only one eye as I had before. I knew only that I couldn't fight. I fled to the north, using over boost to pull away. The Hellcats turned back and went after fresher game. And then I saw what was to me the most hideous of all the hundreds of air battles in which I had fought. I glanced down to my right and gaped. A Hellcat rolled frantically, trying to escape a Zero which clung grimly to its tail, snapping out bursts from its cannon, no more than fifty yards behind. Just beyond the Zero, another Hellcat pursued the Japanese fighter. Even as I watched, a Zero plunged from above and hauled around in a tight diving turn after the Grumman. One after the other they came in, in a long, snaking file. The second Zero, intent upon the pursuing Hellcat fighter, seemed entirely unaware of a third Hellcat following in its dive. And a third Zero, watching the whole proceedings, snapped around in a tight turn and caught the trailing Hellcat without warning. It was an astonishing, and to me, a horrifying death column which snaked along, each plane following the other before it with determination, firing at the target before its guns. Hellcat Zero, Hellcat Zero, Hellcat Zero. Were they all so stupid that not one pilot, either Japanese or American, guarded his weak spot from the rear? The lead fighter, the Grumman, skidded wildly as it hurled back smoke, then plunged toward the sea. Almost at the same moment the pursuing Zero exploded in a fireball. The Hellcat which had delivered the death blow remained in one piece less than two seconds. Cannon shells from the second Zero tore its wing off and it fell, spinning wildly. The wing had just ripped clear of the fighter when a blinding flash of light marked the explosion of the Zero. And as the third Hellcat pulled up from the explosion, the cannon shells of the third Zero tore its cockpit into a shambles. The five planes plunged toward the sea. I watched the five splashes. The last Zero rolled, turned and flew away, the only survivor of the melee. I circled slowly, north of Iwo, sucking in air and trying to relax. The dizziness left me, and I turned back to the battle area. The fight was over. There were still Zeros and Hellcats in the sky, but they were well separated, and the fighters of both sides were forming into their own groups. Ahead and to the right I saw fifteen Zeros swinging into formation, and I closed in to join the group. I came up below the formation and Hellcats now I understood why the surgeon long ago had protested my return to combat so vigorously. With only one eye my perspective was badly off, the small details were lost to me in identifying planes at a distance. Not until the white stars against the blue wings became clear did I realise my error. I wasted no time in throwing off the fear which gripped me. I rolled to the left and came around in a tight turn, diving for speed hoping the Grummans hadn't seen me. No such luck. The Hellcat formation broke up and the planes turned in pursuit. What could I do? My chances seemed hopeless. No, there was still one way out, and a slim chance at that I was almost over Iwo Jima. 
If I could outmaneuver the other planes an almost impossible task, I realized until their fuel ran low and forced them to break for home. Now I appreciated the speed of these new fighters. In seconds they were closing in. They were so fast there was no use in running any further. I snapped back in a tight turn. The maneuver startled the enemy pilots as I climbed at them from below, swinging into a spiral. I was surprised. They didn't scatter. The lead fighter responded with an equal spiral, matching my maneuver perfectly. Again I spiralled, drawing it closer this time. The opposing fighters refused to yield a foot. This was something new. An Aero Cobra or a P-40 would have been lost trying to match me in this fashion, and not even the Wildcat could hold a spiral too long against the Zero. But these new Hellcats, they were the most manoeuvrable enemy planes I had ever encountered. I came out of the spiral into a trap. The fifteen fighters filed out of their spirals into a long column and the next moment I found myself circling in the centre of a giant ring of fifteen Grummans. On every side of me I saw the broad wings with their white stars. If ever a pilot was surrounded in the air, I was. I had little time in which to ponder my misfortune. Four Grummans broke out of their circle and dove at me. They were too eager. I rolled easily out of the way and the Hellcat skidded by, out of control, but what I thought was only a slight roll set me up for several other fighters. A second quartet flashed out of the ring, right on my tail. I ran, I gunned the engine to give every last ounce of power, and pulled away sufficiently to get out of their gun range for the moment. The four pursuing planes didn't worry me. It was the first quartet, how right I was. They had climbed back from their skidding plunge and were above me, diving for another firing pass. I slammed my right foot against the rudder bar, skidding the zero to the left. Then the stick, hard over to the left, rolling sharply, sparkling lights flashed beneath my right wing, followed by a plummeting Hellcat. I came out of the roll in a tight turn. The second Grumman was about 700 yards behind me, its wings already enveloped in yellow flame from its guns. If I hadn't known it before, I knew it now. The enemy pilots were as green as my own inexperienced flyers, and that could be a factor which would save my life. The second fighter kept closing in, spraying tracers all over the sky, tracers which fell short of my own plane. Keep it up, I veiled. Keep it up, go ahead, waste all your ammunition, you'll be one less to worry about. I turned again and fled, the Hellcat closing in rapidly. When he was about three hundred yards behind, I rolled away to the left. The Grumman passed below me, still firing at empty air. I lost my temper. Why run from such a clumsy pilot? Without thinking, I rolled back and got on his tail. From fifty yards away, I snapped out a cannon burst. Wasted, I failed to correct for the skid caused by my abrupt turn. And suddenly, I didn't care what happened to the fighter in front of me. Another Grumman was on my tail, firing steadily. Again, the left roll, a manoeuvre which never failed me. The Hellcat roared past, followed by the third and fourth fighters in the quartet, Another four planes were almost directly above me, ready to dive. Sometimes you have to attack in order to defend yourself. I went into a vertical climb, directly beneath the four fighters. The pilots banked their wings back and forth, trying to find me. I had no time to scatter them. Three Hellcats came at me from the right. I narrowly missed their tracers as I evaded with the same left roll. The fighters were back in their wide ring. Any move I made to escape would bring several Grummans cutting at me from different directions. I circled in the middle, looking for a way out. They had no intention of allowing that to happen, one after the other. The fighters peeled off from the circle and came at me, firing as they closed in. I cannot remember how many times the fighters attacked, nor how many times I rolled away. The perspiration rolled down my body, soaking my underclothes. My forehead was all beads of sweat and it began to drip down onto my face. I cursed when the salty liquid trickled into my left eye. I couldn't take the time to rub it with my hand. All I could do was to blink, try to keep the salt away, try to see. I was tiring much too quickly. I didn't know how I could get away from the ring. But it was very clear that these pilots weren't as good as their planes. An inner voice seemed to whisper to me. It repeated over and over the same words, speed. Keep up your speed, forget the engine, burn it out, keep up your speed, keep rolling, never stop rolling. My arm was beginning to go numb from the constant rolling to the left to evade the Hellcat's tracers. If I once slackened my speed in flicking away to the left, it would be my end. 
But how long could I keep that necessary speed in rolling away? I must keep rolling, as long as the Grummans wanted to keep their ring intact. Only one fighter at a time could jump me, and I had no fear of evading any single plane as it made its firing pass. The tracers were close, but they must hit me exactly if they were going to shoot me down. It mattered not whether the bullets passed a hundred yards or a hundred inches away, just so I could evade them. I needed time to keep away from the fighters which raced in, one after the other, peeling off from the wide ring they maintained about me. I rolled. Full throttle, stick over to the left. Here comes another, hard over, the sea and horizon spinning crazily. Skid, another, that was close. Tracers, bright, shining, flashing. Always underneath the wing, stick over, keep your speed up, roll to the left, roll my arm. I can hardly feel it any more. Had any of the Hellcat pilots chosen a different approach for his firing pass or concentrated carefully on his aim, I would surely have been shot out of the air. Not once did the enemy pilots aim at the point toward which my plane was moving. If only one fighter had spilled its tracers into the empty space leading me, toward the area where I rolled every time, I would have flown into his bullets. But there is a peculiarity about flyers. Their psychology is strange, except for the rare few who stand out and go on to become leading aces. 99% of all pilots adhere to the formula they were taught in school. Train them to follow a certain pattern, and come what may, they will never consider breaking away from that pattern when they are in a battle where life and death mingle with one another. So this contest boiled down to endurance between the time my arm gave out, and I faltered in my evading role and the fuel capacity of the Hellcats. They still had to fly back to their carriers. I glanced at the speedometer. Nearly 350 miles an hour, the best that the Zero could do. I needed endurance for more than my arm. The fighter also had its limits. I feared for the wings. They were bending under the repeated violence of the evading roll manoeuvres. There was a chance that the metal might collapse under continued pressure and that the wing would tear off from the Zero, but that was out of my hands. I could only continue to fly. I must force the plane through the evasive rolls or die. Roll, snap the stick over, skid. Here comes another one. To hell with the wings. Roll. I could hear nothing. The sound of the Zero's engine. The roaring thunder of the Hellcats. The heavy staccato of their 50 caliber guns. All had disappeared. My left eye stung. The sweat streamed down. I couldn't wipe it. Watch out, stick over. Kick the bar. There go the tracers. Missed again. The altimeter was down to the bottom. The ocean was directly beneath my plane. Keep the wings up, Sakai. You'll slap a wave with your wingtip. Where had the dogfight started? 13,000 feet, more than two and a half miles of skidding and rolling away from the tracers, lower and lower. Now I had no altitude left, but the Hellcats couldn't make their firing runs as they had before. They couldn't dive. There was no room to pull out. Now they would try something else. I had a few moments... I held the stick with my left hand, shook the right vigorously. It hurt. Everything hurt. Dull pain, creeping numbness. Here they come, skidding out of their ring. They're careful now. Afraid of what I might do suddenly. He's rolling. A rolling pass. It's not so hard to get out of the way. Skid to the left. Look, the tracers. Fountains geysering up from the water. Spray foam. Here comes another one. How many times have they come at me this way now? I've lost count. When will they give up? They must be running low on fuel, but I could no longer roll so effectively. My arms were going numb. I was losing my touch. Instead of coming about with a rapid, sharp rolling motion, the Zero arced around in a sloppy oval, stretching out each manoeuvre. The Hellcats saw it. They pressed home their attacks, more daring now. Their passes came so fast that I had barely time for a breather. I could no longer keep this up. I must make a break. I came out of another left roll, kicked the rudder bar and swung the stick over to the right. The Zero clawed around in response and I gunned the fighter for a break in the ring. I was out, nosing down again and running for it, right over the water. The Hellcats milled around for a moment in confusion. Then they were after me again. Half the planes formed a barricade overhead, while the others, in a cluster of spitting guns, hurtled after me. The Hellcats were too fast. In a few seconds they were in firing range. Steadily I kept working to the right, kicking the Zero over so that she jerked hard with each manoeuvre. To the left fountains of white foam spouted into the air from the tracers which continued narrowly to miss my plane. 
they refused to give up. Now the fighters overhead were coming down after me. The Grummans immediately behind snapped out their bursts, and the Hellcats which dove tried to anticipate my moves. I could hardly move my arms or legs. There was no way out. If I continued flying low, it would only be a matter of a minute or two before I moved the stick too slowly. Why wait to die? Running like a coward, I hauled the stick back, my hands almost in my stomach. The Zero screamed back and up, and there, only a hundred yards in front of me, was a Hellcat, its startled pilot trying to find my plane. The fighters behind him were already turning at me. I didn't care how many there were. I wanted this fighter. The Hellcat jerked wildly to escape. Now I squeezed. The tracers snapped out. My arms were too far gone. The Zero staggered. I couldn't keep my arms steady. The Hellcat rolled steeply, went into a climb and fled. The loop had helped. The other fighters milled around in confusion. I climbed and ran for it again. The Grummans were right behind me. The fools in those planes were firing from a distance of five hundred yards. Waste your ammunition. Waste it. Waste it. I cried. But they were so fast. The tracers flashed by my wing and I rolled desperately. Down below, Ewo suddenly appeared. I rocked my wings, hoping the gunners on the ground would see the red markings. It was a mistake. The manoeuvre slowed me down, and the Hellcats were all over me again. Where was the flak? What's wrong with them down on the island? Open up, you fools, open up! Ewo erupted in flame. Brilliant flashes swept across the island. They were firing all the guns, it seemed, spitting tracers into the air. Explosions rocked the Zero. Angry bursts of smoke appeared in the air among the Hellcats. They turned steeply and dove out of range. I kept going at full speed. I was terrified. I kept looking behind me, fearing that they had come back, afraid that at any second the tracers wouldn't miss, that they'd stream into the cockpit, tearing away the metal, ripping into me. I passed Ewo, banging my fist on the throttle, urging the plane to fly faster, faster, faster. South Ewo appeared on the horizon there, a cloud, a giant cumulus, rearing high above the water. I didn't care about the air currents. I wanted only to escape those fighters. At full speed I plunged into the billowy mass. A tremendous fist seemed to seize the Zero and fling it wildly through the air. I saw nothing but livid bursts of lightning, then blackness. I had no control. The Zero plunged and reared. It was upside down, then standing on its wings, then hurtling upward tail first. Then I was through. The storm within the cloud spit the fighter out with a violent lurch. I was upside down. I regained control at less than sixteen hundred feet. Far to the south I caught a glimpse of the fifteen Hellcats, going home to their carrier. It was hard to believe that it was all over, and that I was still alive. I wanted desperately to get out of the air. I wanted solid ground beneath my feet. I sat down at Ewo's main strip. For a few minutes I relaxed in the cockpit, exhausted, then climbed wearily down from the Zero. All the other fighters had long since landed, a throng of pilots and mechanics ran toward the plane when it stopped, shouting and cheering. Nakajima was among them, and he threw his arms around my neck, roaring with joy. You did it, Sakai. You did it. Fifteen against one. You were marvellous. I could only lean against the plainy and mumbly, cursing my blind eye. It had nearly cost me my life. An officer pounded me on the back. We were going crazy down here, he shouted. Every man on the island was watching you, the gunners. They couldn't wait for you to come over the island, to bring those planes into their range. Everybody had his hands on the triggers, just waiting, hoping you'd come our way. How did you do it? he asked in amazement. A mechanic ran up to me, saluting, Sir, your plane. It, it doesn't. I can't believe it. There's not a single bullet hole in your fighter. I couldn't believe it either. I checked the Zero over from one end to the other. He was right. Not a single bullet had hit the fighter. Later, back at the billet, I learned that the first group of Zeros, which had flown above the clouds, had fought a far easier battle than our own formation. The large Hellcat formation had climbed from the overcast directly beneath their own planes, and they had the advantage of diving, surprising the American pilots before they even knew what happened. Naval aviation pilot Kinsuke Muto, the Yokosuka Wings star pilot, had a field day. 
shooting down four of the Grummans. The other pilots confirmed his victories. Muto flamed two Hellcats before they could even make an evasive move. But the day's toll was staggering. Nearly forty, almost half of all, our fighters had been shot down. The day following the Savage Air battle, which cut our numbers in half, I came down with a severe case of diarrhea, which might have been expected, inasmuch as Ewo's entire water supply came from rainwater collected in tanks, cans and other containers. My mental condition was no better than my lessened physical ability. The loss of forty planes and pilots in a single action staggered me. Equally disturbing was the sight of our inexperienced pilots falling in flames, one after the other, as the Hellcats blasted their outmoded zeros from the sky. How much like lay the battle had been, except that now the obsolescent planes were zeros and the inexperienced pilots were Japanese. The war had run full circle. The diarrhoea sapped my strength and kept me bedridden for a week. My recovery was slow. The evening of July 2nd excitement spread through the billet. Orderlies dashed back and forth outside, rushing from the radio shack to the command post. I went out and stopped one man, who told me that our radio monitors were receiving a sudden increase in enemy message transmissions. Although the majority of such messages were in code, which we could not decipher, the transmissions came from enemy units not too far from the island. An attack was underway, that much was clear, as well as the fact that it would come very soon. All pilots reported to the command post for orders. I was refused permission to fly. The commander felt I was still too weak properly to handle my fighter. The next morning, all pilots reported to the airfield at four o'clock. Several scout planes took off immediately to search the ocean. Nothing happened during the next hour. I returned to the billet to catch some more sleep. At six o'clock, bugles shattered the island's quiet, announcing that an attack was underway. Men ran across the fields to handle their guns, and the forty fighters sped down the runways to take up their interception positions. I walked out to the yard in front of the barracks to watch the action. Far to the south, at least fifty planes appeared, headed directly for us. Hellcats, the forty zeros circling overhead, turned to meet the enemy fighters in a head-on attack. I had only one or two minutes to watch the fierce air fight. A new sound came to my ears, planes diving. I turned and saw a squadron of Avengers in four separate flights hurtling down against the main strip. Their attack was timed perfectly. Our forty fighters had been drawn into battle by the Hellcats, leaving the island wide open for the bomber's run. I was still running for the billet when thundering explosions shook the ground beneath my feet. That was enough for me. I dove for the ground, burying my face in the volcanic ash. I tried to grovel my way into the dirt, to get away from the steel splinters which hurtled through the air. The explosions continued unabated for several minutes. Every time a bomb went off the ground beneath me heaved. Dust was everywhere. Then the noise ended. I rolled over on my back. The Avengers were moving off to the south. I stood up and looked at the columns of smoke and dust towering over the airfield. Another attack, a second Avenger squadron, sliced through the billowing smoke clouds, plunging directly toward our runway. The bombers appeared to be headed directly at me. I turned and ran as fast as I could, throwing myself on the ground behind a large rainwater tank behind the billet. Almost at the same moment I saw the bombs fall from the Avengers. I stared at them in hypnotised fascination, they grew in size, swelling rapidly as they plunged through the air. I ate some more dirt. A blast of hot air punched the ground and flung me over. Shattering explosions hammered at my ears. I opened my eyes. There was only dust and smoke boiling up from the ground. I was more shaken up and frightened than hurt. I had suffered no injury, except the bruises from diving for the protection of the soil. Gradually my ears recovered. I heard the billet collapsing and dashed out of the way as the water tank fell apart with a roar. The air battle was still going on. I watched the planes, listened to the racing engines and the coughing sounds of cannon from the Zeros, the staccato bark of the Hellcat guns. What was I doing on the ground? To hell with the diarrhoea. I ran out of the shelter toward the command post. The sight of a third wave of bombers screaming down on the field stopped me in my tracks and I turned and fled again for shelter. 
This time their aim was poor. The bombs hurtled beyond the airstrip and dug craters just beyond its end. This time I made it to the command post, a flimsy tent, still undamaged by the bombs. I told a grim-faced Nakajima that I wanted to fly. All the operational planes are off the ground, Sakai, he answered unhappily. Besides, I thought the doctor said you weren't fit to fly. There's nothing wrong with me, sir, I snapped back. And there is a fighter available, I pointed out a Zero standing at the end of the runway. That ship had a bad engine when it was checked before, the commander replied. But it may be all right now. The mechanics have been working on it for several hours. He looked up. All right, go ahead. I threw a salute and ran out of the tent. Sakai, I turned. It was Nakajima. Take care of yourself, Sakai, he called. This is no longer lay, take care. Several men were dragging the Zero off the runway, trying to get the airplane to a revetment before the next bombing. I shouted for them to swing the fighter around again. While I was in the cockpit, a mechanic clambered up onto the wing. The engine's been irregular, sir, he shouted over the din as I started her up. It should be all right now. The engine caught perfectly. I wasted no time in warming the fighter up, but gunned her for takeoff. The wheels had just lifted when I saw the 4th Avenger squadron plummeting down for its attack. I was in no position to oppose the bombers when I was barely off the ground. I dropped the nose and skimmed over the water to gain speed, pulling up twenty miles away. The bombers had completed their runs, and now a fifth wave of planes hurtled through the smoke and dust to lay their eggs. Not a single fighter opposed them. Every zero in the air except for my own was battling for its life against the Hellcats. I returned to Iwo at 13,000 feet, heading for the scrambling dogfight. The battle was over. Now that the Avengers' bombs were expended, the Hellcats broke off with the Zeros and turned away to escort the bombers back to the carriers. There was nothing I could do. I returned with the remaining Zeros to the Iwo strip. Again, the Hellcats had slashed our ranks badly. Again, half of all the fighters which took off to intercept the American planes were lost. Twenty out of forty Zeros. In two battles, the American fighters shot down 60 out of 80 Zero fighters. It was incredible. Naval aviation pilots Aluto and Ensei Nalatsuo Hagire were the lights in an otherwise dark morning. Each destroyed three Hellcats, and a number of other pilots put in claims for one fighter shot down. But these victories were incidental. Our planes had done nothing against the Avengers. The two airstrips were in a shambles. It seemed impossible to land but somehow all the pilots snaked their way around the craters which pitted both runways. The enemy would continue to come, and what could we do? Even if every pilot in the air shot down several of the enemy's fighters, we were powerless to stop the bombers from working over our airfields and other defences. All through the afternoon and well into the night, our staff officers tried to find a way out of our dilemma. There was no rest that evening, Ground crew worked until dawn to clear the runways and fill the craters. The pilots heard nothing of what had occurred in the staff conference. We went to bed early in the few shacks and tents which remained standing, anticipating another morning attack. The Americans did not disappoint us. Again, every Zero fighter on the island raced into the air. The results were even worse than we had anticipated. Nine Zeros, most of them badly shot up, came back to land at Iwo. In three battles, we had now lost 71 out of 80 fighters. Again, we did nothing to foil the bombers. Moreover, their aim had improved. Iwo was in incredible chaos. Most of its installations wrecked. The field again pitted with bomb craters. Exactly eight bombers were left on the ground, eight torpedo planes, which had been protected by their shelters. Almost every other bomber and fighter under repair or hidden in its shelters was destroyed. After landing, we trudged back to the command post. Not a man had the energy or the spirit to talk. We sprawled on the ground, weary and despondent, watching the men running frantically over the runways, trying to fill in the holes, fighting the flames which roared fiercely in the wrecked buildings. Several minutes later, Commander Nakajima walked slowly from the command post tent and approached our group. We rose to attention. Nakajima waved his hand, telling us to be seated. The commander was visibly agitated, and he talked in a low, faltering tone. 
He told us that the staff officers had argued all through the night that they disagreed as to what action against the Americans we should take in the future. One group insisted that we had no choice, that continuing to throw interceptors at the enemy raiders was useless. In a few days we would find ourselves without any planes at all. Therefore, the only thing to do was to strike back with all the strength we could muster at the American task force, which one of our scouts had located 450 miles south-southeast of the island. The second group agreed, in theory, to the attack plan, but they argued, what can only nine Japanese fighters and eight single-engine bombers do against the enemy task force? The Americans can launch from all their carriers at one time several hundred interceptors. The American fleet was the same force which, on June 20th, had virtually wiped out all our carrier-borne planes in the Marianas. The argument, Nakajima said, was ended conclusively when the Iwo Wing commander, Captain Kanzo Miura, finally accepted the plan to hit back at the American fleet. Miura set our departure for noon on July 4th, the enemy's Independence Day. We never made the attack as planned, anticipating that we might employ the occasion for a raid against their fleet. The rampaging American pilots returned to Iwo on the morning of the 4th and tore the island's facilities into a flaming, smoking ruin. We could not even take off. Again, the runways were rendered useless. We sat around the command post, just as we had done before, while the staff officers argued among themselves. Captain Miura, we found out later, refused to budge from his position. We are being bled white, he told his staff. The end is clearly in sight if we continue fighting only defensive battles. What should we do? Stay here and see every last plane shot out of the air while the enemy fleet is unmolested. No, we will attack, and this same day, as soon as the runways are repaired, I want every plane off the ground. Nakajima related the details of the meeting to us, I realise, he concluded, what we are sending you out to do. There is no use in my saying otherwise. You will be flying to almost certain death. But here he hesitated. The decision has already been made. You will go. He looked into the eyes of each man, and may good fortune accompany you. The commander withdrew a sheet of paper from his pocket and read off the names of the pilots selected to man the planes for the flight, a one-way mission, it seemed. There was no excitement among the pilots. Each man rose when his name was called and saluted. Mine was the ninth name to be announced. I would lead the second Fei formation of the nine zeros. Muto, easily the best pilot among us, would lead the third V. Nakajima selected a lieutenant to lead the fighter squadron. Nakajima came up to me, obviously unhappy. He placed his hand on my shoulder. I hate myself for sending you out today, my old friend, he mumbled. But he sighed wearily. There seems nothing else for us to do, Sakai. Good luck. I had no words for a reply. I offered my hand, we clasped in silence, then Nakajima turned and walked away. We broke up our group almost wordlessly, the pilots selected for the mission left to pack their belongings. I stared at the few personal things I had brought with me to Iwo. I thought of the men who would deliver them to the families of the dead. How would my mother act when they handed her the bundle, tell her how it happened? The hours slipped by very quickly. It's ironic, I thought, only a few days ago I thought each minute had become a lifetime, when those fifteen Hellcats were gunning for my blood. Muto approached me in my tent and asked for any ideas I might have on the mission. I looked at him for several moments. Muto, I... I don't know. Ideas. There aren't any good ones. When we reach those ships this afternoon, the enemy fighters will swarm all over us. All I can say is we have our orders, we'll go, that's all. I felt sorry for the young pilot. I personally was no longer a great asset to my country. The difficulties I had experienced in evading even the inexperienced American pilots told me beyond any doubts the extent to which my half-blindness had hobbled my dogfighting abilities. But Muto, he was Nishizawa, Ota and Sasai all in one, a brilliant pilot. He did not belong in the air with us today. To throw away his life on such a hopeless mission was sheer stupidity. With one of our newer fighters at his disposal, Muto was our best chance to destroy a dozen, perhaps two dozen, enemy planes. 
He was the kind of pilot who belonged over Japan, ready to defend the country against the B-29s, which were certain to attack in ever greater strength. And now what a waste, Muto, of course, realised none of these thoughts. He smiled at my remarks. All right, Sakai, I know. If the gods smile, he shrugged. Otherwise, let us at least die together like the friends we are. An hour later, all the pilots chosen for the attack mission lined up at attention before the command post. Behind the tent, fastened to a high pole, a broad white banner flapped wildly in the wind. Imprinted against the white were the ancient words, Namu Hachiman Daibosatsu. A literal translation would read, We believe in the merciful god of war. The banner was a replica of the emblem used by a Japanese warlord in the 16th century, when an endless series of local civil wars rocked the length and breadth of Japan. When we were at Ley, our flyers had never resorted to such psychological crutches as morale boosters. To me, the theatrical display was a sign of weakness, and nothing else. It betokened mental retrogression on the part of our officers, who attempted to impress themselves with the fire and fury of the ancient times when wars were decided, for the most part, by individual courage and skill. But those days were centuries past. I was no staff officer. I participated in no campaign planning, and heaven knows I was far from being even an amateur strategist. But certain things were obvious. Our own officers were resorting to what amounted almost to modem witchcraft. They were beating the drums of patriotism, trying to convince not only their subordinates but themselves as well, that we could recoup the tremendous losses we had suffered by emotional displays and threats shouted at the cursed Americans. How could these men so resolutely refuse to recognise truth? Did it take a world upheaval to make them realise that our zero fighter, which long ago had been the world's best, could be outflown, outdived, outclimbed, and outgunned by the Hellcat, as well as by many other new planes I had not yet seen? I looked at the banner. It had been there for many days, but today, for the first time, I really saw it. Were we to put our faith in this symbol of supernatural strength, how was this to help us gain victory? Would it stop the flaming traces of the Hellcat's guns? As a fighter pilot, I appreciated better than most the wisdom of relying upon my own strength and my own skill to escape the death which in a dogfight was never more than a split second away. I could count only upon myself and my wingmen and the assistance I knew I would always receive from my fellow pilots. Had I gone into battle only shouting historic phrases, I would never have survived this long. All of this was now drastically altered. My skill in preserving my life against every assault no longer counted. Not one of the seventeen pilots standing at ramrod attention before the command post entertained even the faintest hope that he would ever see his friends alive, or that he himself could possibly survive. I loved my country dearly, and never would I hesitate a moment to defend Japan with my life. But there is a vast gulf between defending one's land even to the last and wantonly wasting one's life. To me, the ancient warrior's incantation meant something else. Namu Amida Butsu, the ancient Buddhist chant, believe in Buddha. The prayer murmured by those among my people who were breathing their last on their deathbeds, or who offered solace and comfort to those among them who were dying. I believed in Japan, but not in the so-called merciful god of war. I was willing to die for my country, but only in my faith, in the tradition of the samurai, as I had been taught all my life, as a man, as a warrior. The thought soothed my anger. By the time Captain Miura came out of the tent to address us, I was relaxed. The captain climbed onto the podium of empty beer cases. He looked slowly from man to man, unhappy, regarding us as if it were the last time he would see our faces. You will strike back at the enemy, he began. From now on, our defensive battles are over. You men are the flyers chosen from the Yokosuka air wing, the most famous in all Japan. I trust that your actions today will be worthy of the name and the glorious tradition of your wing. He hesitated for several moments. In order for you to perpetuate the honour which is ours, you must accept the task which your officers have put before you. You cannot, I repeat, 
You cannot hope for survival. Your minds must be on the word attack. You are but seventeen men, and today you will face a task force which is defended perhaps by hundreds of American fighter planes. Therefore individual attacks must be forgotten. You cannot strike at your targets as one man alone. You must maintain a flight group of planes. You must fight your way through the interceptors, and Captain Mayura drew himself up straight. You must dive against the enemy carriers together. Dive along with your torpedoes and your lives and your souls. A great roaring sounded in my ears. What was he saying? Had I heard him right? A normal attack will be useless. Even if you succeed in penetrating the American fighters, you will only be shot down on the way back to this island. Your death will be ineffective for our country. Your lives will be wasted. We cannot permit this to be, his voice boomed at us. Until you reach your targets, the fighter pilots will refuse to accept battle with the enemy planes. No bomber pilot will release his torpedo in an airdrop. No matter what happens, you will keep your planes together. Wing to wing, no obstacle is to stop you from carrying out your mission. You must make your dives in a group in order to be effective. I know that what I tell you to do is difficult. It may even seem impossible. But I trust that you can do it, that you will do it, that every man among you will plunge directly into an enemy carrier and sink the vessel. For another minute he looked at us. You have your orders? he snapped. I was stunned. We had been sent out before this on missions where our chances of survival seemed hopelessly remote. But at least we had the chance to fight for our lives. This was the first time a Japanese pilot had actually been ordered to make a suicide attack. In our navy it was an unwritten convention that, once a plane was crippled on the high seas, far from its base, the pilot would dive against an enemy warship or transport, since he had no chance to return home. We were not the only pilots to do so. It had happened with the Americans, with the Germans, with the British. It would always happen so long as men fly and fight. But no Japanese air commander had ever told his men, go out and die. The celebrated Kamikaze Special Attack Corps was organised four months later in the Philippines by Vice Admiral Takijiro Onishi. Before he proceeded with his suicide planes, as they are described elsewhere, he queried the pilots under his command and received an overwhelming assurance that they would, if necessary, sacrifice their lives to defend their country. The kamikaze operation, however, was an elaborately planned campaign, eventually utilising airplanes specifically designed for such operations. In the beginning, however, the planes which were to dive against ships were loaded with bombs and escorted by Zero fighters whose pilots were under specific instructions to return to their base. In this fashion they operated as fighter escorts and provided eyewitness testimony to the results of the attack. At Iwo it was entirely different. Even the Zeros, which carried no bombs on the mission, were expendable. Captain Miura, who gave us our orders, died in action, while Admiral Onishi committed harakiri after Japan's surrender. Miura's talk had a tremendous shock effect upon the assembled pilots. Whatever the reaction of the men toward deliberately sacrificing their lives, the captain's words, his manner of speaking, and his background of outstanding valour in combat buoyed the spirits of most of them. No longer did they approach the mission with the purely negative attitude of departing without any chance. Now it was different, now that they knew they would never return. The men took on an air of determination. Their lives were no longer to be wasted. The sacrifice of their small number would be more than compensated for by the loss of one or more huge enemy ships, possibly causing the death of thousands of Americans. I was in a turmoil. I had a cold, sinking feeling of revulsion in my brain. I was neither furious nor desperate. My heart and my emotions might perhaps be called frozen. The ancient words returned to me. A samurai lives in such a way that he will always be prepared to die a man. The samurai code, however, never demanded that be constantly prepared to kill himself. There is a great gulf between deliberately taking one's life and entering battle with a willingness to accept all its risks and hazards. In the latter case death is acceptable, and there can be no regrets, man lives with his head held high. He can die in the same fashion. He forfeits neither his personal honour nor that of his country, 
and he has the satisfaction of having given his nation his best. It has never been difficult to become so exalted in the heat of combat as to defy the worst odds, to fight when necessary, to attack when outnumbered. All these things comprise the life of a man dedicated as a warrior, but how does one quietly and objectively decide in a few hours to go out and kill oneself? It was to be remembered, however, that we were still in the Navy, where orders are orders. A chilled silence followed the end of Captain Miura's address. Presently we saluted, the captain left the area, and the pilots broke up into small groups. I told the two men assigned as my wingmen, You understand fully the captain's orders. They nodded. I trust you are prepared, then, for what we must do. My only instructions to you are these. Stay with my plane until we arrive at our target. Never break away from my V formation, no matter what happens. Stick with my plane. They both were so serious. Young old men, all of twenty years old, Muto and his two wingmen joined us. Muto grinned broadly and joked. Well, since all of us are going to die in a few hours, we might as well look at each other. I want to be sure to remember all your homely faces later on. He broke the tension. We laughed and sat down on the ground. Muto kept up the laughter and jokes. After a few minutes, however, the laughter became forced and the jokes stale. Several pilots dropped from the mission came up to us. They brought gifts, all they could find among their meagre personal supplies, some cigarettes, candy and bottles of soda. The gifts themselves were, of course, an expression of their attempt to cheer us up, to tell us of their regret that we, not they, had been selected for the fatal dives. The significance of this was not lost on us. Supplies at Iwo were almost totally exhausted, and we were sure that these sparse offerings meant that everything left among the other pilots was gone. Their eyes were wide and sad, telling us more than could be said, with inadequate words. Muto no longer joked. He sat silently, lost in his own thoughts. The very air seemed to crackle with the tension which had again arisen among us. It was time to take off on the last mission. The other three pilots came out of the tent, and we all walked down to the fighters. Standing alongside my plane, I looked at my parachute. Then, as one man, all nine pilots flung their chute packs onto the volcanic ash of the runway. The Zero wouldn't start. I turned the engine switch back and forth, right and left. Finally, she caught, vibrating badly. The engine was no good. For two days this plane had fought in combat, and the stringent power demands of the dogfights had nearly burned the engine out. When I switched from one generator to the other, the propeller dragged almost to a stop, instead of slowing down slightly. Unless I used both generators, the propeller stayed dead. Normally I would never have attempted a takeoff with a plane in this condition. But now I was embarrassed. I looked at the other fighters. Mechanics were working on at least four of the other eight planes. My difficulties were not unique. But who required a plane in perfect working order? Remember, Sakai, this is a one-way flight. You need to cover only 450 miles in the air, not 900. You're not coming back from this mission. The engine's condition no longer seemed important. I waited for the fighter to warm up. The eight bombers sped down the runway, one after the other. The first zero moved into takeoff position. I followed, taxiing slowly, my wingmen behind me. On both sides of the runway, the mechanics and other pilots stood at attention, their caps off, waving handkerchiefs as we thundered down the strip and into the air. We formed into our Vs and turned toward the distant enemy fleet. I felt drained of all emotion, cold and lifeless. I turned. Iwo Jima was a speck on the horizon growing smaller as we bored through the air, dwindling to a dot on the vast ocean. I felt so small. One man in an insignificant fighter plane, and the ocean stretching endlessly below me, I looked back again, barely able to make out Iwo. The horizon blurred and wavered before my eye. I felt dizzy and upset. My mother's face, tenuous and filmy, filling the sky, a vision, but so real, she smiled at me. She didn't know that soon I must die, that I was about to kill myself. I stared at her face. The vision faded slowly and disappeared. 
A terrible loneliness gripped me. I was lost in an endless sea. Everywhere below me there was only water, with the sky above. The horizon was misty and unreal, blurred with distance. I looked at the fighters in front of me, the bombers ahead and below. They did not seem to be moving, but were poised in mid-air, rocking gently, rising and dipping easily on the invisible swells of air. Was it all real? I shook my head to clear away the fog, music, listen. A piano. The moonlight Sonata Hatsuyo had played that for me. Hatsuyo, her face appeared. Was it a vision? The music began to fade, then swelled louder and louder, crashing and thundering in my ears. I had never told her. Hatsuyo, I love you, I cried. No one knew. No one but me. I thought of her. I turned back and looked for Iwo Jima. I saw only the endless ocean. The music vanished. The sky was clear again. The drone of my engine beat strongly in my ears. The zeros kept in perfect formation. Precise, exact, moving together toward their flaming, bloodletting destiny. The loneliness fled. You are too maudlin, Sakai, I cursed. You are a pilot, a samurai. You wallow in your emotions. The mission do what you must do. I tried to plan the last moments in the air, the best method of diving into a carrier. What was the weakest spot? The stack. Dive into the stack, take all three fighters and plunge together at the thin hull at the waterline. Hope there would be planes lined up on the deck, their tanks filled with fuel, their bombs loaded. Dive into the planes, explode their bombs and fuel tanks, and in a split second, transform nearly 30,000 tons of ship and thousands of men into a shrieking, fiery, bloody hell. The ocean flowed beneath me. The minutes passed quickly until we saw, far off to the right, a column of smoke, flayed by the wind, drifting slowly over the water. This was the first landmark, Pagan Island, jutting 300 feet from the water, a barren, hideous mass of volcanic rock, steaming and glowing with the heat of its fires far below the surface. It resembled the pictures of hell I had seen in my Buddhist books when I was a child. It was ironic. The last piece of land I was to see in my life was bubbling, boiling, flaming, and hideous. Forty minutes later, black clouds appeared on the horizon before us. They towered many thousands of feet above the surface, lashed the sea below with high winds and torrential rains. I looked at the map, the enemy task force, as pinpointed by our scouts, should be lying somewhere beneath those fierce squalls. Now that we were so close, I thought of nothing but the warships cruising along beneath the storm. Everything except the ships and the dive I was a make was blotted from my mind. The old excitement was there too. It was the same all over again. I thought only of combat. The ships, my plane, the dive, and the interceptors which might appear. We were within the routine scouting radius of the enemy fighters. They might spot our formations at any moment, and the warships' radars were certain to have caught us in their scopes, the eight bombers nose down, our fighters close behind. At 16,000 feet we dropped into a thin cloud deck, were engulfed for several seconds in blinding white, then broke through and continued to descend. At 13,000 feet something bright flashed in the sky. There, far ahead, and several thousand feet above us, the brilliant flash was repeated. It could only be sunlight glancing off a plane's wing. I saw the first fighter, a Hellcat, its broad body and wings unmistakable, dropping through the clouds. Another, more, how many were there? Look at them, dropping through the clouds, one after the other, a seemingly endless column of the dangerous fighters. I fired a burst from my guns to warn the other pilots, the squadron leader and Muto banked their wings in response. The American radar had pinpointed our position perfectly. The column of fighters descended from the clouds less than a mile ahead of us, and only half a mile above. I counted the enemy planes as they ripped through the fluffy overcast. I lost count at seventeen. They saw us, the seventeenth fighter. The last one I had time to count rolled abruptly to the left and dove. Immediately the other fighters swung around and screamed down at us. Miura's words boomed at me. Refuse to accept battle, keep your planes together, fine words. But how? 
Look at those fighters come. Hellcats were everywhere, many of them pulling out of their dives to attack from beneath our planes, even still more of them continuing to burst through the clouds to take us from above. A second column of more than twenty fighters pounced wildly on Muto's trio of fighters. Still another column, more than thirty planes, it seemed, came out of their dives, climbing rapidly, gunning for the bombers from beneath. I held my breath as the Hellcats clawed into the bombers. In two blinding explosions, the first and second bombers disappeared, blown into tiny pieces of wreckage as their torpedoes went off with shattering roars which shook my plane. Now the Hellcats were within firing range of Muto's trio. The three Zeros sliced up into a wicked loop, evading the Hellcats. They did not attempt to return the fire, as they could have done. I pounded my fist helplessly against the glass. Muto had a dead shot. He could have rolled to the right and gunned two fighters from the air without even trying. Another Hellcat column raced in against my formation. I hauled back on the stick, going up and around in a tight loop, my two wingmen sticking to me. The column was too long. We came out of the loop to find several fighters plunging in, their wings ablaze with their firing machine guns. I rolled, fast. More fighters, another loop, twice. Roll to the left, snap out of it, here they come. How many are there? Take her up and around, refuse to accept combat. You can follow orders just so far. I could not follow mine, not now. Not with the sky filled with hellcats, I could evade just so long, and that would be all. I snapped around in a tight turn at a diving hellcat. He flew right into my shells. The fighter flipped wildly through the air and then dropped for the ocean, trailing a fast-growing plume of smoke. I had no time to watch him go down. I kicked the rudder bar and yanked the stick over hard, just in time. A hellcat skidded crazily past the zero, and still they came in, one after the other. I didn't even have time to jettison the belly tank. Then the last of the column was passed, dropping toward the ocean, beginning their long pull-outs to come back again. I jerked the toggle and the tank dropped free. I turned back. My wingmen were still with me. Good. They had followed my instructions to the letter, concentrating entirely on my plane. Matching me turn for turn, I was soaking wet. I tried to wipe the sweat away from my face. No time. All sixteen fighters of the column which had jumped my planes were out of their dives, skidding around in long climbing turns, coming back at us. Again, an eternity of diving, looping, skidding, rolling, stick over, back, forward, right, left, kick the rudder bar. Skid her around, bright, flashing tracers. They missed and continued to miss. The American pilots had poor aim. I glanced at the bombers. It was a slaughter. Slow, sluggish with their torpedoes. They wallowed helplessly in the air, unprotected by the Zeros, which fought frantically to fend off the Hellcats. A ball of fire disappeared in a searing burst of light. Another torpedo had exploded. In less than a minute, seven bombers were gone. Not even the fuselage or a whole wing of one plane remained. Seven bombers had disappeared in as many explosions. The Zeros fared hardly any better. I saw two of our fighters engulfed in flame, swooping and rolling crazily. The pilots didn't even try to get out. They stayed with their fighters, burning to death. I failed to see a single Hellcat in trouble, except for the one fighter I had shot up. There were just as many of the Grummans in the air. We had little or no chance of evading combat by attempting to outmaneuver a horde of fighters, which, it seemed, could match us turn for turn. The Hellcats were fully as agile as our own planes, much faster, and able to outclimb and outdive us. Only the inexperience of their pilots saved us, had they been better. Every zero would have been shot down in less than a minute. As it was, mine was the only Japanese formation to be seen anywhere in the sky. The Hellcats, which had wiped out the other planes, now joined the original sixteen fighters, which had worked us over. Flashing blue wings and white stars, wings blazing with firing guns, above us, below us, to the right and to the left. Hellcats everywhere. They reminded me of Lay, when twelve of us tried to shoot up a single bomber. We shredded our own formations in our eagerness to get at the enemy. Now the Hellcats were doing the same. Their organisation was gone, they skidded wildly, frantically evading their own fire, trying to get out of the way of other pilots hungry for blood. 
I watched a fighter come at us, guns blazing, then forced to roll away as another Grumman sliced in from the side, paying no attention to the airspace around him. Their eagerness saved our lives. We flew in the middle of a tremendous Hellcat formation. The enemy fighters spent more time trying to avoid collisions than firing at us, but I saw no way of breaking off the fight. We were 400 miles from Iwo Jima, and still 50 miles or so from the American carriers, which we had not yet seen and might not be able to find. Even if we did, how were we to break through more than 60 Hellcats, each of which was so much faster than the Zero, fate gave us a slim chance. The running air fight drifted toward a cumulus cloud hovering over the water. A Hellcat flashed by, leaving an opening in the ranks of the circling fighters. I rolled over and shoved the stick forward, diving with full power into the protecting invisibility of the cloud. I glanced back. My two wingmen were still with me. For several minutes the world went mad. I saw nothing as the raging winds within the cloud flipped the zero crazily. Then it was over. I was out, the fighter again in control. I turned to see two zeros, far below my own plane, spinning wildly as they hurtled free. In a few seconds they were out of their spins and climbing to rejoin me. The sky was clear of Hellcats. We had flung them off, the irony of our survival. We had escaped almost insuperable odds, only to save ourselves to die. We reformed into a V and turned to the south again. We were relieved at our escape, but the immediate future justified no elation. The clouds thickened as we drew nearer to the enemy fleet, they became thicker and thicker, and the airspace between the cloud bottoms and the ocean surface dwindled to a mere 700 feet. Blinding sheets of rain fell with such force that at times the Zero heeled over dangerously on one wing, buffeted by the weight of the water pouring down like an avalanche. We had to keep going, the clouds dropped lower and lower toward the ocean. We were in a long, gradual descent, maintaining altitude directly beneath the storm base. Then we were only sixty feet above the surface, whipped into foaming whitecaps.